how do you bring the best of the container world to the best of the telecom world? Cloud native containers is just a natural evolution or virtualization. Kubernetes is the de facto standard, right? It's open source. Cloud native is key. Four years ago, cloud native was not a very well-known term. Kubernetes was one of many orchestrators and it was a little unclear where, how much penetration it was going to gain. And now it's really the default, de facto way of running most workloads in the cloud. Cloud native approach uh, has a series of principles and methodologies that really helps you hit that scalability, but at the same time keep your costs under control. Portability, reusability, efficiency, burstability. These are topics that are really, really important to telcos. And that's why cloud native is really important to them. If you're launching a new brand, a new service, then I think there's a real case for, for using cloud because of its inherent benefits in terms of elasticity, scalability, if you want to trial new stuff out there. And one of the things that we really get out of using something like Kubernetes is, you know, you hear a lot about skill shortages and resource shortages. You know, all of a sudden the telcos, by using some of these technologies, have access to what's being produced by all the engineers of the hyperscalers, you know. Google and, and, and Amazon and, and Microsoft, you know, have, have a global cloud footprint. And, and with that scale, they've got the skills to build a stack that is incredibly rich, uh, incredibly powerful, attractive to developers. So the question is, how, how can tel telcos benefit from that that technology base. The more we make networks cloud native, uh, the easier it's going to be to interwork in between hyperscale cloud and telco and FB the deployments. I think cloud native is, is really the, the thing that makes it at scale. Virtualization delivers a lot of benefit, but to be able to scale, also to bring it into the 5G context, IoT and all these um, kind of things, and that's where cloud native really plays. Welcome everyone to the Lerma Museum and to Telecom TV's annual super panel, sponsored as always by Hewlett Packard Enterprise and Intel. Those of you who have been with us before know what to expect. For those of you joining for the first time, uh, a very warm welcome. Please enjoy the refreshments, the food, the cars. It's an amazing collection of cars to have here, but not just yet, because we want to kick things off first keep you in suspense, keep you waiting, with a 30-minute panel discussion, and we'll follow that up with a Q&A, so you'll all have a chance to put your questions to our guests um, after we have our discussion. And as you'll have seen from the video, we've got a very timely topic for you this evening. From NFE to cloud native, future-proofing your 5G investment. And we're going to be hearing a lot more about cloud native, no doubt, in the, in the months to come. Let me introduce you to our panelists first, starting on my immediate right with Vicky Lonka. Welcome, Vicky. Vicky is Vice President of Product Management and Development at Verizon. And next to Vicky is Domenico Convertino, VP Product Management, Communications and Media Solutions at HPE. Yeah. Welcome back to Super Panels. It's me. Next, we have Adrian Comley. Your first time with us, and you're very welcome. Uh, General Manager of Dynamic Network Services at BT. Next to Adrian is Renu Navale. Welcome back again. Renu is Senior Director, Edge Services and Industry Enabling at Intel's Data Center Group. And last but by no means least, we have Alexis Sars, who is Head of Network Cloud and Virtualization at Orange Group. Alexis, thanks for joining us. Welcome, everyone. Um, the telco transformation journey has got well and truly underway with, with NFV, but it's, it, it's only the start. The process is continuing with the adoption of cloud native technologies and methodologies as service providers evolve into DSPs, digital service providers. But what do we actually mean by cloud native? What is cloud native to us? And more importantly, what is the cloud native telco? So why don't I ask each of you in turn for, for views on cloud native. Vicky, let's kick things off. Well, you know, I, I think I'm struggling right now with what cloud native is not <laughs> because I'm squarely grounded right now in a place where NFBI is sort of where we're, we're deploying functions in, in that space um, because the concepts that I care about as an operator around networks are, are understood in that, that particular space. But in, the cl in cloud native uh, concepts, 
you know, like ports mm -hmm. and the things that I care about, WANs and LANs and interfaces and things of that nature are not uh, native and cloud native. Mm -hmm. And so until those concepts become something that we can translate between the two, uh, I think it's going to be tough to adopt that as a, as a green field for us. So I think for, for me, it's a hybrid world that we're going to have to manage for quite a long time. Domenico. Well, cloud native means many things, but fundamentally microservices based, stateless, very easy to instantiate, quick to retire, so all the scaling to be really <clears throat> instantaneous. And uh, the most important thing is, again, this is history of the stateless, so that is very easy to instantiate multiple instances of uh, whatever network function in the cloud native core so that uh, there is no dependency from uh, having uh, data associated to the single instance of the network function, but uh, really, mm -hmm. in the spirit of the cloud, having the ability to share the data that are common across a data layer for all, uh, for all the function. This will help, even the delocalization, de will, this will help uh, the distribution of the network and applications, and will provide the new capabilities to the, to the future core networks. Yeah. And Adrian, how do you see the cloud native telco? Yeah, so, so I'm a product guy, so I'm, I'm probably going to approach it slightly differently, perhaps from my, my fellow panelists. But um, I would see this in terms of what it means for our customers. So yeah, we've got the abstraction, we've got infinitely scalable hardware, uh, but we're not quite there in terms of microservices running in containers, as far as I'm aware, anyway. Uh, so as far as our customers are concerned, I think what they're looking for is something that looks and feels like a service they buy from an AWS or an Azure, uh, where they want something that is very scalable. It's at a different kind of commercial model, and that could be pay-as-you-go type approach, moving away from the traditional rental and connection model that they've tended to buy things from, especially network products from their telco. Um, so I think for, for a telco, it, it's a fundamental change in the telco system stack that enables us to develop products for our customers that are far more agile and flexible with different commercial models than ever before. Great. Thanks, Adrian. Renu. Sure. And I'm going to build on what both, both of uh, you know, our panelists just said. It, it is cloud-native microservices. It is about service agility. Uh, but it's also about you know, having your organizations, your processes, your methodologies, your design principles all follow cloud cloud architectures, models, um, as well as economics, uh, so that you, you are truly delivering, um, delivering the, the service agility while at the same time keeping your costs really low, um, keeping your d development methodologies extremely agile um, and flexible in order to be able to deliver the um, agility that our customers need. Right. And Alexis. So being the last one is more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Find something new to say. <laughs> for me, what is maybe missing for us, or what we want, is to have a standardized solution in order to keep this optimization of the cost and the operations to provide you new services, is to have a multi-vendor ecosystem. And for this, we did a standardized solution and also interconnection with other operators in order to have a, a solution that can rely on scalability in the solutions. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's the business, the operations, this uh, possibility to provide to the customers and try and buy solution, but also um, to have an ecosystem that we can have partners to change partners and to have this multi-vendor ecosystem. Mm -hmm. We're going to touch on ecosystem uh, a little bit later, but th this isn't a case of cloud native arriving on the scene and pushing aside all the work we've done on NFE. You, you, you alluded to the um, hybrid operation going mm -hmm. forward with Verizon. Yeah, I think that's going to have to be true because um, it, I think it is a much heavier lift than people imagine and who, who, who build applications for the cloud to understand that those um, same applications have to work in networks and network architectures are very different than cloud architectures. And cloud architects don't necessarily understand network architects. So all the same challenges we had when we first started doing virtualization and we took the principles we learned from data center virtualization and ported those over to network virtualization really have to be true too because the virtualization is only one aspect of the problem. So uh, any views on about how we're going to see cloud native adoption alongside our existing NFE investments? 
I guess one thing, going back to what we were talking about earlier about microservices running on containers, then if you, if you kind of Google cloud native, it says, well, actually what you want to do is, is move away from the traditional VNFs, which were born out of splitting software and hardware by, by the, the vendors, um, and break those VNFs up into microservices. So having core components within the VNF that then discover each other and build on each other, kind of like Lego bricks. Um, so, I think, one, we're not there yet, uh, but two, I think that's the evolution path for, mm. for VNFs. It's smaller, more reusable components. And then you can apply that to um, wider services as well. So, for example, for a, for a telco, that means uh, logistics, getting a piece of kit from uh, a manufacturer to a customer site, whether that's um, a UCPE or a server or whatever it might be. But just that action then becomes a small um, uh, reusable component that you can build into bigger products. Are we, are we missing anything at this stage? Are, are we saying as a, as a community of, of telcos, we are an, a unique user case uh, and we have our own requirements that may or may not all fit with the, the cloud native models? Ah, this is even an excuse that we had uh, hmm. so many times to not change and to not innovate that probably... No, I would say that <clears throat> uh, virtualization has been a step because we are coming from a world of appliances and from a world that was heavily standardized. So we, we used the virtualization to decouple the infra layer from, uh, from the application layer, but reality is that uh, when we are speaking about cloud native, we are speaking about a completely different type of software architecture that is much more flexible and dynamic. At the end of the day, it has to answer uh, demand from customers to have much more uh, dynamicity and the ability to scale uh, in, a, in a completely different uh, way and agility for the services that we are providing uh, to them. This is something that the cloud native architecture can provide to us, but at the end, it doesn't work if at the end of the day, it is not proven to be uh, free from any type of lock-in from whatever type of vendor. And at the end of the, of the day, it needs to be operated, right? So when we are saying uh, we wasted time with virtualization because cloud native is better, it's not true because our operation guys, they made a lot of experience during this year and you need the time to transfer people and skills. It's not something that is happening overnight just because there is, you know, a fancy technology that, that you know, you want to promote and push, uh, and push on production. So, there are a number of skills that have been created uh, in, uh, in the operation departments, the, but this is just a journey that needs to continue because the cloud will be even more demanding on um, skills that are less, let's say, old telco uh, oriented and much more, uh, much more going towards the composability uh, of, uh, of the software, right? Alexis, you, you, you're nodding agreement. For the virtualization, it's a way to modify the organization, the way we work inside the company, but also with the partners, and to move to a collaboration in order to have a focus on the customer, focus in the operations, and not as before in the appliance more, a world that is more, I request for each vendor a delivery, I work with SLAs, penalties, and uh, a long way to reach and to match the uh, customer requirements. At the end now, it's the flexibility to provide these developments to the customer. And uh, uh, the idea is to be ready for the 5G in the future. So this transformation is key to provide all the expectation that we have with this 5G. Yeah. Renew. Technology provider from an Intel perspective, uh, what we, what I believe is that these technologies will coexist for a long time to come. If there are, uh, you know, like for example, VNFs or virtual machines, uh, the agility is good enough, the performance is good enough. Why would you change it un unless there is a real business need to actually re-architect that? But if there are certain functions that do need the agility, that you do need to transform into cloud native in order to deliver the services agility or the business impact, then you will see the ecosystem and you will see the vendors actually changing their architecture to accommodate those business needs. So I think, I think you're going to see a coexistence of these technologies for a long time. It's not as if you're going to just completely wash away the investments you know, we've made up until now. 
We've heard over recent years the importance of NFE to 5G and vice versa, 5G to NFE. Um, does the success of 5G commercial success also depend on a successful introduction of cloud native technologies? Because the, the 5G journey has only just started, we've got another 10 years here. Is, is this just as important to 5G as NFE? <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you look at the, the 5G core network functions, they are very, very simple. So they are not too much complicated, and you cannot compare to the to the complexity of uh, of a VNF. So there is uh, there has been a decision in the industry to go to again to something that can be really distributed in terms of uh, functionality in the in the network. And uh, this is exactly to achieve the type of uh, agility that, and dynamicity that the cloud native as a software technology will then, uh, will then provide. So definitely, yes, because if we look there, it doesn't make sense with such a simple network function to stay on, uh, uh, you know, on OpenStack or, or on VMware, right? We need to move on container exactly for that, uh, for that reason, right? Is there an urgency to, to move to cloud native? And we, we have heard a, a few telcos talk recently about we've been stuck in virtualization too long and we need to keep moving. Do we, do we, are, we, are we being pushed along by the trough of disillusionment of NFE perhaps or, or just the general market hype that we, we see around cloud native? I mean, what we see at the moment um, is um, VNF has been around for, for a while now, and they haven't really taken off. And if you talk to, to well, if I talk to our customers, multinational corporations, talk to analysts like Gartner, then they'll, they'll say the same thing. There are no global deployments of service chain VNFs at scale anywhere. But what we see at the moment is the, the rise of a couple of things. Um, first of which is some um, very commercially attractive uh, price points for new CPE about to come on the market. Um, commercially attractive and also high performing. And secondly, the rise of industrial IoT as a use case for key customers in the manufacturing, mining, oil and gas sectors, which I think is really going to drive forward the UCP adoption. So, you know, we see this taking off now. I might argue that I disagree that there aren't large-scale deployments of service chains at scale, but that could be a conversation for another day. Um, but I, I also think that um, there, there's a place for NFVs today in the services that are available today. Um, but I do believe or have an, a point of view that with mobile edge computing, cloud native is the way to start um, because most of the functions we will deploy in the mech uh, will by default be cloud native because they are different types of workloads than we will deploy in current universal CPE applications today yeah. uh, because their purpose and their function is going to be different in mobile edge computing. And so they could start with a cloud native journey to begin with um, and could be consumed by customers and the applications that are built on that stack in a cloud native fashion. The edge is, a, is the perfect example. So whatever is running at the edge has a diff completely different economy if it is a cloud native compared to a virtualized uh, network function. And considering how important is the space, the consumption of these things are so important at the edge, I think that that's, that's the perfect example on where, you know, the, the, the the business and the technology need are driving the innovation towards, uh, towards cloud native. And can be done today, yeah? because on Mac we have very good uh, example of things that can be deployed now that are exactly in this direction. Yeah? I agree. Yeah, I completely agree. I think to truly realize the transformative promise of 5G, Mac, and edge computing, um, you also have to open up that ecosystem to the developer community. And the developer community, the, the largest developer community is the cloud developers. And they understand cloud native. They understand microservices. They understand you know, the programming paradigms that they've been exposed to in the cloud. And, and that is you know, the, the 5G and Edge can thrive if we open up to that developer community. Alexis, let's pick up on, on, on that. On, we, we, we've gone around the subject of ecosystem. Let's, let's, let's really tackle it full on now. Um, 
How, how do you, as a CSP, select the right ecosystem? It seems to be an evolving and a, and a changing dynamic. Are, are, there, are there differences? Is a new ecosystem required? So coming back to your previous question, we started two years ago in the hype, mm -hmm. thinking that everything can be done uh, in virtualized world. And by default, we decided to do everything virtualized for the new things obsolescence capacity, and we discovered that the journey was not so easy. And uh, after one year, we decided to stop this uh, way to do the, th the things. And to come back to the basic, it's what are the benefits, uh, and to define and to virtualize only what is needed for business or for the operational uh, savings. And at the end, we find that it exists, this world where we can provide new services, in B2B market and uh, also for the SME market, where the automation is key to provide without human uh, intervention or human configurations for this SME market. And for us, it's a way also to modify the way we work, as mentioned before, in order to be focused for the business. So it's a very it's lower than before, than the expectation at the beginning, but now the basics are good. Uh, we are focusing the business, and it moves also network people to the business, which we were quite not quite far in, from the network and the business. And now, through this new technology, we are closer. And how do you work with partners? How do you work with the, with the ecosystem? So the partners today, it's quite difficult to, to, to select a partner based on the reality of what is the cloud native today, because there is not a native cloud today. So it's more relationship with a partner, to make sure that they are willing to do what we want, to work together in this ecosystem, and it's more to trust, more than a reality of an equation that you select someone based on a ranking. More the ranking is the trust with the vendors, with the ecosystem that is not vendors anymore, our partners to co-design, to work together, uh, to fulfill the requirements to the customer. Vicky, you, are you seeing different requirements when you, when you look at, at partners? Well, you know, uh, we recently hosted something called the 5G Challenge. It was sort of like a shark tank mm. where we brought uh, companies in to compete for a million dollars mm. in funding. And so a lot of these were new companies. Some of them were companies with two employees. Some had, you know, a few hundred. Um, but they were asked to bring new ideas to the table that would leverage the mech in 5G specifically. Um, and, you know, we were so going through the, the rounds of, of analysis, but it was interesting that people brought, you know, the kinds of applications they brought to us that would be deployed at the edge and in the mech. All of these were cloud native. Mm. All of those uh, often leveraged the fact that, you know, by moving the functions or moving the, the workloads onto the mech, you know, they could improve battery life of the devices or they, they had robots, they had all kinds of things. But the interesting thing was it, we were sort of changing where the economics happened because by improving the um, efficiency and the latency of the device that the, the, some of these companies, they were really just moving the problem from one place to another. So from their individual you know, compute that they needed in the processors in their devices to the mech. And so I think, but they were still cloud native apps, but it sort of changes the game too. Um, but we're seeing initial ones where these are companies we've never even heard of before, right? That are bringing innovative new ideas to the table that are, be, that are cloud native. And I think that's where a lot of the excitement in the, indus in the industry is. So it's not necessarily that uh, we wouldn't partner, but I think the partners are not the traditional partners that we might have, all, all of us might have, you know, um, I'd like to find a better word than been in bed with, mm. but been in bed with in the past. <laughs> I was going to say been in a relationship with, but that's just uh, yeah, as bad. Yeah, yeah, that would have been better. <laughs> Aidan, yeah, so I, I think just build, building on that, um, if, we, if we go back to some comments I was making earlier about now customers want to consume in a more cloud-like way, then they're looking to pay telcos in a different kind of way as well. So therefore, a telco supplier selection is going to look at how you can back off your commercial model with your customer back down our supplier chain. So if a customer is pay now moving away from connection and rental to purely paying on an as-you-go basis, then that's how I want to play my suppliers and my, my vendor partners too. So we're looking for, for vendor partners that will actually work on the new commercial model, as well as being agile and flexible. Um, so yeah. 
Fine. His Did word uh, y- sounds like music to me, so yeah. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I thought they might. So my CEO yeah. decided to move the entire portfolio in a consumption-based model by 2022, right? So um, we share this, uh, this view. We, we believe that um, a lot of the technology is going to be more and more perceived as a service by whoever is using, uh, using that. So there can be <clears throat> a telco service or, or can be you know, even uh, some IT computer or storage, whatever. At the end of the day, uh, everybody goes towards uh, you know, experiencing a service and experiencing a service according to the, to the, to the expectation. So I fully agree, but I think it's even more, more deep the problem than just that. Because this is an industry that is used to deal with uh, always the same vendors and trying to get uh, solution from the same vendors. And these vendors are used to work according to standards. So you know the, the, the entire culture and the entire process is, uh, is not applicable to the, to, the, to the new world. The new world is going to be completely different so the real challenge for the, for the industry is to understand if we want to continue to do the same things with the same people in the same way, and if this happens, then probably will be the end of this industry, or the industry will be cornered to provide just, just connectivity, exactly because the demand is going in a completely opposite, uh, opposite direction. So I think it's a, there are many ways to start creating a different ecosystem, but uh, what has been just mentioned in terms to stimulate new ideas, to bring in new companies that have a different type of business model in mind as well is probably a good, uh, a good start, right? I think uh, also in addition to what uh, our other panelists said, uh, there, there are layers of ecosystem that we need to likely foster in different ways. Uh, there's still kind of the, the foundational or horizontal ecosystem, the uh, network function vendors or the orchestrators and others that you have to uh, probably influence and foster to, to the cloud native way. Uh, there are application vendors that are likely, more likely to move to cloud native much faster. Uh, but as you look at where we're starting to see some of the initial traction for 5G and Edge, which is things like industrial IoT, uh, the vertical ecosystem is also very unique. So when we sat down with some of our industrial teams to say, hey, who are the partners you are working with, working that supply chain backwards, it's a completely different set of you know, white box vendors, completely different set of um, real-time deterministic software providers, uh, integrators. So there's a different ecosystem that some of us who've been in networking or telco uh, are new to. So you're going to see unique vertical ecosystems across you know, a number of these verticals, the retail one is going to be completely different from industrial, it's going to be completely different from healthcare and smart cities and so forth. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to have to deal with multiple layers of ecosystem for all of this to come together to say, hey, I'm able to deploy these services in this vertical and actually derive revenue that comes through the entire supply chain. Well, let's take a look at some of those services because we want to involve our audience in, in a minute. But before we do, um, what are some of these 5G-based cloud-native services and applications that will ultimately generate revenue for, for CSPs? What, 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 are, what are we looking at, Alexis? So in our case, we have launched some pilots in order to define with partners mm. what are the usage that they have behind the 5G and to move from the technology to a usage in order to provide to the customer the service with a new age. And it's not clear because it's true that the technology is so powerful, we can do so many things that we have to define the good usage behind. And we are not able to do it alone. We can't uh, say what the customer wants. And this ecosystem is what you say, it's verticals are totally new. It's uh, healthcare, it could be education, it could be uh, government, it could be many things. And so we have to work with all of them to define the good usage before launching something so now we are testing in a humbling way, but uh, doing that. 
Great. Renew, let's go down the line. Renew, what, what, what services and applications are we looking at? Just based on some of the research we've been doing, um, there are some use cases which are a little bit horizontal. They can uh, span across multiple industries, like um, um, you know, vision inferencing, which can be used for like either digital security surveillance or facial recognition or industrial site uh, safety or retail productivity um, analysis. So you have you know, so vision inferencing can is like a horizontal that can span multiple verticals. Uh, there's also uh, things related to video and media and content delivery and visual cloud. I mean, 82% of internet traffic is video and media. So I think there's going to be a lot of different types of use cases that's related to that type of a uh, data workload. And then based on the different IoT verticals, where we saw the biggest promise or the likely the earliest uh, deployments because it translates directly to business value was uh, was industrial and retail to begin with because they uh, you you could see some quick tangible benefits uh, with some you know some of the use cases um, on 4G and other forms of connectivity even before 5G. And Adrian, you've been looking at some IoT-based use cases here. Yeah, so, so a couple of quick examples of uh, industrial IoT. Then just building on your your video analytics point. Um, if you've got a um, manufacturing environment and you want to use video analytics to look at a machine, and if, it, if that machine rocks slightly, then you want to be able to send in your maintenance crew. Um, so we, we tested this over 4G and uh, 5G. So in 4G, you can reliably run one high-def camera. Um, the problem is it doesn't scale. So you can't run two high-def cameras, and you can't run ultra-high-def. So you need 5G to be able to do that. And then 5G gives you the capability to um, analyze that machine, the video analytics, um, to be able to detect an anomaly, to then switch to slow-mo video recording, and then send that out to an expert off-site over 5G to analyze that video, and then inform the local maintenance crew what they need to do to keep that machine running on that shift until it can be taken out of production during a natural kind of change of uh, manufacturing cycle. Uh, another very quick example is um, we've just conducted the first um, trials of 5G at Birmingham Hospital um, for remote use of a haptic glove by paramedics. So these guys go out in an ambulance, they attend um, an accident scene, they can then be guided by an expert um, doctor from the hospital over the 5G network to do ultrasound on somebody lying in the road who's had an accident. The um, expert in the hospital uses a joystick to send signals to that haptic glove that dictates where they want the ultrasound scan to go. And they can then decide on whether to treat the patient at site or bring them back to the hospital. So there's just two examples of how we see services dramatically changing with 5G. Domenico. Oh, we stick to the example of the, <clears throat> of the edge and of Mac, mm -hmm. because really there uh, makes sense to have cloud-native uh, cloud application. So we have a very good example. So we are in a car museum here, right? Mm -hmm. So the collaboration we are having with Mercedes in Formula One, so there is a lot of uh, uh, data management of all the data collected by the sensors on the Formula One cars that are happening on-site in, uh, in the box. Uh, so, you know, versus what was happening before, that all the data were collected, stored, then sent back in the UK, etc. So this is, uh, this is an example of uh, how much can be done in terms of uh, uh, data, data crunching at the edge, closer to where the data are generated. And this can help a lot of real-time uh, real e examples over there. So low latency, et cetera, is strictly connected to this as well and uh, can have applicability in, in, uh, in industrial IoT, can have applicability on logistics in, for a number of industries where this type of requirements are quite normal, right? So, yeah. Yeah. And Vicky, you obviously see, yeah, we talked about the edge here. I think there's, um, I think to your point, we're seeing lots of applications in the fan experience yeah. in all kinds of venues where lots of people congregate and where uh, there's a desire to get information and use that information to deliver a superior fan experience to people in stadiums or in, you know, whatever kind of venue Probably where they con yeah, congregate. Um, and you can do that much more uh, 
pers in a personalized manner uh, with some of the 5G technologies coming out. Cognitive video is huge, and everybody's mentioned that. Um, I think that there are real applications for that now in every vertical that, that we operate in. Um, and smart cities are still a huge opportunity because, you know, it really allows the technology to be put to to use for good, mm -hmm. um, not just for profit. And um, I think that's really important to people right now. That The challenge in smart cities, though, is you know most communities have elections every four years. Mm -hmm. And we find it is difficult to get a idea from inception to execution um, in place in a lot of communities because of that transition that happens just as a natural element of, of uh, turnover in a community. Thank you all for those. We did promise interaction, so now's your chance. If anybody, and I see a hand already, if anybody has a question for our panelists, now's your opportunity. We do have one or two microphones. Um, okay, there's one down here, just at the very, very front. It's been waiting patiently. If you could just say who you are and who you represent, that would be great. Absolutely. Thank you, Ahmed Ijaz from Ericsson. Thank you for this insightful discussion. Now, um, Clearly, I think from your discussion, it seems if uh, 5G, industrial IoT, and edge computer, computing are going to be some key drivers for cloud native adoption. But regardless of when these drivers or these tailwinds happen, there are many operators who are heavily invested into virtualization, and they look at cloud native with a varying degree of skepticism or excitement. However, for many other operators, say, for example, many operators in Africa, who are yet to embark on, say, even the virtualization journey. Mm -hmm. They're still in the physical world. Do you think it makes sense, it's a good idea, to leapfrog to cloud native? Mm -hmm. And I think there was one comment, as you know, there's at least a redeeming quality with virtualization. Your operations uh, learned a lot with it. So at least that's one huge advantage uh, with this uh, journey in the yesteryears. However, going forward for those operators who can potentially leapfrog uh, or focus more on cloud native, uh, what do you think is the key uh, checklist of requirements that should be checked before, hey, yes, we can jump right away to cloud native? Great. Who, who wants to tackle that? Who wants to tackle the, um, can we go straight to cloud native if we haven't already started our virtualization expertise? Mm -hmm. well, that's just a bit unfair, but you do have operations in, in, in Africa, don't you? So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Spain is North Africa. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, I think that it could be do, uh, done in a smart way. So, it's not necessary to do virtualization, as mentioned before, uh, as we wanted at the beginning. But we can do a small virtualization that when it's, the benefit is clear, in order to provide new services or operational benefits. And the benefit is the organization, uh, is to modify the way we work, to have the operational team and with the engineering team, with marketing, IT network, all together working. And it's true that digitalization modifies the way we work. And it's great to start with something. So maybe to define a little step uh, with uh, benefits coming from the business or coming from the operational uh, optimization and to do it. And it could be a good, a good, a good way to also to acquire the knowledge you know, from the operator point of view. Because when we are in appliance world, it's more the vendor that has knowledge we are more with uh, providing solutions, and we manage the vendors. In this modification, we are more involved. We are knowing better what is happening in the network. And it's a good way to acquire this knowledge that will be, no matter if it's cloud native or not cloud native, this type of knowledge, at the end, is the, the mindset, is the way we work. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think there's a path that says you could crawl, walk, run. Um, but I think if, if you haven't gone there at all, if you, it depends on how long you can wait. Because if you wait too long and, and until everything is cloud native, then that company may be out of business because some other disruptor will have come in and taken over operations uh, with some other solution that wasn't available. But the reality is that the functions that most network operators need to run a network are not fully available in the stack as cloud native today. And they're going to have to be able to write their own or build their own. And I think that's not necessarily the core or expertise of most most of, of those types of companies. 
I think Vicky said earlier as well, there are, there's so many uh, companies out there that want to help move you know, a telco to a cloud native environment, ranging from startups through to fully fledged household names, that um, they would want to work with companies in Africa as well to take them on that journey. Um, and it really depends then on the business case for that particular telco as to how quickly they want to make that jump. So it will depend on um, you know, how, how fast they want to invest, how much money they have, where their customers are going, and their revenue stream. And that will help determine how quickly they make that move. Right. I think the, the problem in, in Africa has been historically the scarcity of qualified engineers. And this drove even a tendency right, to outsource or to go towards managed services of the, of the network. right? So I think the point is different. The, the, the real question is not uh, you know, to do one step or double step migration. The real question mark is, do we believe that the network becomes a core asset of the business and needs to be managed by the operator? Because this is the real, the real point. In the moment you, know, you, you go cloud native, the, the dynamicity that you are bringing in the, in the way the network is, uh, is deployed needs to be compatible with the business priorities that, uh, that, you are, uh, that you are getting. And are we sure that having an outsourcer doing that job on behalf of the company is the right, uh, is the right receipt? I think this is a bigger problem, right? that needs to be, uh, needs to be addressed in, uh, in, certain, in certain countries, together, again, with the need to have uh, the proper engineers working, uh, with, working in operation. That has been historically a uh, big issue in, uh, in Africa. Yeah. And I can give one example where one of the operators we were working with in India wanted to leapfrog uh, you know, for one of the virtual functions. Uh, but they said, hey, we need help. We need cloud-native experts embedded in our team. So Intel, can you give us like what, three or four experts to embed in our team? And we were struggling. Like We were wondering where we would get them from. Uh, we didn't have them internally to embed in their team. We were trying to find them from some of the uh, kind of the outsourcing companies. Uh, so until some of the fun fundamental or foundational ecosystem comes along or moves along, it's going to be hard for some of these companies to even leapfrog. So you do, while, while you can't wait for the whole ecosystem to become cloud native, you need some foundational parts to become cloud native. You do need the availability of you know, engineers or expertise, technology. You need, you know, we've been making contributions into open source, Kubernetes, Maltese, and others. You do need companies that downstream that and commercialize it. And you know, you need some of that basic blocks, building blocks available for for some things to kind of, you know, even for companies to truly leapfrog. Great, great, thanks. Uh, another question. Um, there's a there's a hand at the back. I can see. Got the mic already. Hello, Francis Hayson from Appledore Research. Um, we're obviously at an NFV conference, but um, I just wonder whether the panel um, feels that um, the, we've, we've got a situation where we see virtual function, virtual network functions and virtual applica uh, network applications as something that's very distinct from other functions and other applications. Do we, um, does, the panel, does the panel feel that the, the emphasis on network functions being something different than other software functions is the, is the biggest impediment to cloud native? Well, as a network operator, I have to care a lot about the network function. Um, so I, that's where my emphasis is, because that's where the disruption is happening for us initially at the edge, and where we deploy those in our on our network. So, you know, virtualized firewalls, virtualized routing, et cetera. Um, so those have been the primary ones right now. But as customers come to me and say, um, I also want to deploy my applications in the same device at that edge, that's where the problem becomes apparent that I have to consider, you know, these hybrid worlds where maybe for now a VM has to exist with, you know, the container stack that my customer wants to have on the same set of infrastructure. So it's a new set of problems that we have to solve in, in terms of how we manage and support that. Um, and, uh, you know, I learned a few things actually today from, you know, different folks here that, that will help me figure out what the right strategy is going to be for us as we go on that journey. So let me be precise, otherwise Francis is not happy, right? So, I mean, <laughs> we defined the, 
network function, what is standardized by 3GPP, okay, so it is cloud native in, uh, in 5G, and this is 5G core, right? So while the cloud native applications, for example, are the third party applications that can be hosted at the cloud edge in order to provide uh, whatever type of, of services to, uh, to in the, from industrial IoT to healthcare, uh, et cetera. So there is a difference. Of course, there is a difference because the cloud network functions are standardized, so there is a standardization. We know what to expect from each of them and the way they should expose uh, uh, their own outcome to the, to the rest of the, of the software architecture, correct? For the, the cloud, uh, for the cloud application, the reason to adopt cloud native application is again in lowering the total cost of ownership that especially at the edge is a, an extremely meaningful topic. Thanks. Uh, any other questions from our audience members? Oh, there's one, one at the very back. Yeah, there's always a question in the back. <laughs> <laughs> so I have again on UBCube. So uh, I just want to know in your journey towards cloud native applications, if I'm looking at the back office, how many of your OSS, BSS systems are already cloud native? I'm a vendor, so if you want, I can answer for, for my portfolio, yes, <laughs> easily. <laughs> so I have pretty much the entire portfolio is cloudified with different level of maturity, with different level of maturity, because not the entire portfolio is fully, uh, let's say, microservices based and, and, cloud, uh, and cloud native. But uh, you know, so today, pretty much the entire portfolio can be delivered by us uh, in on-prem uh, project, as was traditionally done in the past, in private cloud or from public cloud as well. This is the potential. Then the demand we are getting from customers are to stay on-prem or on private cloud. There are very, very few exceptions of customers who are really asking to deploy, you know, backend uh, applications on public cloud. You know, if we, if we consider traditional networking services like MPLS that have been around for the uh, best part of 20 years, then they're going to be delivered on what we might call old, older systems infrastructure, probably co-developed by the telco and maybe some, some board-in software as well. The transition now is to buy off-the-shelf products produced by third parties who are experts in that particular field as opposed to developing in-house. So I think you'll find a lot of telcos are in that transition period and have still got almost like a dual stack where they'll support their products that have been around for a considerable amount of time on perhaps an older stack, and the newer products are being developed on the um, perhaps more cloud-native stack. I think we have time for one more question from our audience. Is anyone sort of nearer the, the front? Or? Hi, um, my name's Simon Elkins from, from Layer 123, <clears throat> and it's a bit of a technical question, really. So a few years ago, you had the Open Systems Interconnection model, um, and do you feel that's now relevant with the cloud? Because back in the day, it surprised a, a, um, a deal of separation between the layers. So do you find the, the, the edges are now being blurred, or is it still relevant? Is the OSI model still relevant in our cloud world? I think it is because uh, you know I'm still you know trying to deliver services in service of the application layer, and all the other layers in the stack have to work together in order to provide the application experience. So you know that's not the technical answer, but the, but that but that's the answer from how we have to build products for customers, and I have to thread all those layers together. So in in our product development, OSI still matters. I think, sorry, just to build on that, I totally agree. I think it, it, you know, if you're looking at an SLA from a telco, then you can look at an app's performance SLA. Um, if you're looking for something like packet delivery, then that's still at layer three. So you, you need to operate at layer seven and layer three um, to, make, to, make, to deliver, I think, the overall SLA a customer is looking for. And I think the, some of the concept around service mesh is also coming from that where you do need you know, east-west communication between the microservices at the, up, even at the kind of the below the layer seven. So the, the concept of service mesh is to kind of foster that type of uh, microservice intercommunications. Great. Well, if, if it's all right with everyone else, we, we are out of time. We just, we've just gone over our um, deadline by only a couple of minutes, so we're quite good this year. Um, please. Thank our panelists for the time this evening. <laughs>